All right, this is our work of resistance, resilience reading. And since we've had such a, a, a kind of bumpy start, I thank you for your patience and I thank you for sticking with us. Um, I just want to say um, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, this session is recorded for good, bad, or indifferent. Um, Um, uh, leave your comments in the chat section, um, and the, the readers' bios are in uh, the About Place journal link. Um, please join me in, in, in welcoming the first reader, Daisy Basin. Hello. Uh, my poem's called Optional Reading, American History 201, the year 20, assuming we don't ruin it all. I saw the fox digging her burrow bringing her tail in with her, gorgeous, all that fur I'll never touch, a color with no name, the way fire has no singular hue or nebula. She scrabbled at the leaf meal and paused, alert for hawks perhaps, predators I don't register, warm in my house with my thumbs and my lacy motherboards. It was the week of the winter solstice of the shortest day when we have the least opportunity to see light unless you consider candles stocked against storms. It was a week of vice and comeuppance, consequence of reality. Truth disputed lies, there I said it. There was an ice storm making filigree of the trees, making bullets of water. There was impeachment. It means to fetter, to ensnare. It means we were a little more free. It means we could rest in our death here before you. going to ask Hannah to go ahead and start on the second reading. Okay, um, so I'm reading a prose, po prose piece called the way, the way We Rely on Each Other. In the future, the future that please understand is now, I've gotten used to this weird liminal space, this in-between. I'm going back to Kansas in the future that is now and I'm carrying with me the things which keep me alive. Medical equipment, obviously, books, no doubt, the computer, the paint, and the canvases, my cat. The grasslands, prairie, the hills of what was once called the Midwest have turned to sand. The heat is too much for most people, most being subjective. It is still not safe for me to kiss the girl I am in love with, and I no longer know if she is real or a ghost. In a reality that was smushed up against this one, I've arrived in Mary Birdland, unclaimed territory in Antarctica, a home for the outcast. This isn't the first time we've tried building a community here. We're trying again. I let myself sink into this new definition of home. Here I can love who I love. Here I can kiss and caress without fear of infection. My God, my God, how chillingly resonant this pandemic feels of the HIV crisis. Certain lives disposable, certain lives not. I want to imagine this to be a good place, this land where Crips, Queers, BIPOC, and others have gathered, an unclaimed territory. We must maintain a lack of ownership over the earth so as to maintain a sense of ownership over ourselves. An illusion, really. We cannot stay in isolation any more so then plants can exist without other life, other ecosystems blooming around them. Like our foremother, Octavia Butler, we plant seeds and stories, learning to live off the earth. Those with medical training, not just Western practices, take care of ailment, ailments. Teachers teach, we all parent, but the metal of our wheelchairs, our crutches, our prosthetics, this challenges us. And it is for this metal and these parts that we must break isolation. Eventually, the girl I'm in love with must leave, breaking quarantine for a bionic limb repair. She will, I know, find someone else, someone with less compromised lungs when she leaves. Sometime in the past, in a class on feminist theory I was taking in Kansas, we discussed resiliency, the problems of it, the way one can be expected to get up and get up and then get up again. I know this is true, just as I know this is how I survive. I'm not immortal, my body is not infallible, 
If I get the virus, I will likely die. But I have found a way to keep going, a way to know that there is no reclaiming the flowers she would give me, right up until she broke my heart. Because the flowers never belong to her, never belong to any of us in the first place. In this community we have built, I keep waking up each morning and I keep thanking our gods for kinship we have fostered. When she left, I longed to stay in bed for days, not drinking, not eating, a fast road to death, when you have no muscle for your body to draw on for nutrients. Organ failure, I've seen it happen. But we rely on each other here. I mean, really, truly rely on each other. And when the woman next door came to get me out of bed that morning, she wouldn't let me go hungry. She wouldn't let my body give in. Now, each morning, I thank the gods for the kinship and for the woman who gets me up, who lifts my body into my wheelchair, who throws my windows open so I can see the land, soaking up a rare but not extinct rain. Sand, rain, and snow mixed together, a portent perhaps for the end of the world. But when I go outside and feel the heavy heat against my skin one moment and a blast of icy air the next, I miraculously do not go into shock. I am asked what my crit magic is and I say being alive. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. That was an excerpt from the way we rely on each other. Make sure you connect to it, the largest story in the journal. Our next reader up is Corey Pressman. I have a brief poem called All Those Ancient Egyptians Were Right. All those ancient Egyptians were right. We should just worship cats erect triangles against death, pound papyrus into paper, and etch our alphabet in mute stone so that our spectacular struggle and extinction can serve as a long distance warning. Thank you, Corey. Thank you. Up next, we have Anne Hedren. Thanks, Jacqueline. Um, uh, I'm going to read uh, a passage from my essay, Regeneration. I could see the cover of Time magazine from down the block. There it was, clipped outside to the outside rack of a London newsstand, a full page photo of snarling billows of something more sinister than smoke pouring upward from a mountain that looked like it had just been beheaded by a supersized chainsaw. The big blow up, Time's headline screamed. It was Mount St. Helens my Mount St. Helens. I grabbed the magazine and paid for it and clutched it to my chest like a compress as I ran down the steps into the tube station. I was 23. Mount St. Helens was young too, for a mountain, a mere 40,000 years old. Its famously elegant snowy cone, now gone forever, was thought to be only 2,200 years old. Before it erupted on May 18, 1980, St. Helen's silhouette had often been compared to Mount Fuji's. I boarded the train and began to turn the pages of time, slowly, stunned. I remember a body sprawled on top of a half-submerged pickup truck, trees and cabins and deer tossed aside like old toys, whole forests stripped and scattered like matchsticks, lakes smothered, ash-caked cars a hundred miles away. But it was the aerial shots that shocked me the most the ugliness of the mud and lava, the quantity of it, the way it had coated everything. I began to cry. The summit rippled, churned, and then collapsed as more than two billion tons of rock, snow, and glacial ice fell away in the largest landslide, landslide recorded in human history, writes Eric Wagner in After the Blast, the ecological recovery of Mount St. Helens. The eruption began at 8.32 a.m. on Sunday, May 18, 1980, lasted nine hours and caused the deaths of 57 people. The fact that it happened on a Sunday morning is nearly always noted in the recounting of the Mount St. Helens story because, as Wagner later tells us, at 8.30 on a Monday morning, several hundred loggers would have been arriving for their shifts, the mountain ringing with the high winds of their chainsaws. The lateral blast would have killed them all. In February of this year, I asked for and eagerly received an advanced copy of After the Blast. 
I started to read it just as a strange coronavirus triggered illness called COVID-19 was flaring up at a nursing home outside Seattle where I live. As February turned into March, reliving the drama of Mount St. Helens became my reading refuge from the daily drumbeat of what we soon began to call a pandemic. First a few deaths, then dozens. First a few safety tips, then stay at home orders. No masks yet, the healthcare workers needed them. 40 years ago in that moment on the London tube, as I took in those first photos of the largest landslide in human history, I knew that soon, maybe not right away, but soon, I would need to go home. I was no longer a young woman in love with her scrappy life of travel and waitressing. I was a homesick daughter of the Northwest. I understood that Mount St. Helens, a volcano, had done exactly what volcanoes are destined to do, that it was not an unnatural act, not an outrage against nature, but nature in primal, inevitable action. But to see the landscape so wounded, so changed, shocked me, and it awakened me to the startling depth of the love I feel for my sodden, seismically fragile hometown corner of the U.S. In the summer of 1982, after eight years away, I finally moved back to Seattle. Like so many young Northwesterners before and since, I understood this was my habitat. I went to work as a news writer at a TV station. Everyone but me, it seemed, had a real Mount St. Helens story, a story of covering the, the eruption as a reporter or cameraman, a story of chopper pilots flying in as close as they dared day after day. Their tales filled me with intense cub journalist envy. I was the new hire, which meant I spent the swing shift chained to the newsroom, writing 30 second stories for the anchors to read between the reporter's longer pieces. And then, just before 11 p.m., racing over to the hand-cranked teleprompter, which I ran during the newscast. But I did have my own private version of a Mount St. Helens story, which was that I came home, and I began to learn what the mountain's real story was, not the mud, not the destruction, but regeneration. Thanks. There's more and a lot more weaving in of the virus. <laughs> Ah, it's a fine, fine piece of work, um, and you'll be glad uh, that you go back to the journal to hear the to read the complete one. Up next, uh, and I want to thank you, Anne. Um, up next, we have Lacelli A. Fitzpatrick. Hi, thank you so much, Jackie. Um, before I introduce my piece, I just want to wish my mother a happy birthday. Um, I am because she is. Thank you for your resilience tonight, Jackie. So the piece that I'm about to read is titled, We've Been Here Before, the 1619 Project. We've been here before, bound face to face with the unknown, shoved into tight spaces, shackled, strangled by the suffocating, unsanitized stench of capitalism and communicable diseases, unable to breathe, muzzled behind iron mask, savagely uprooted and scattered across sugar plantations and white cotton fields, forced to reimagine home in slums and shanties with no running water or happy birthday songs to wash our hands or food because we could not eat what we reaped, gathered bones, black and brown bodies thrown into unmarked graves. We were here before, <laughs> carried in the resilient blood of our ancestors who with girded loins transported us across their backs, dismantling systems with their own tools, quilting fabrics from scraps, souls stirring delicacies like songs, divining altars and organs in their lungs because the earth is a tabernacle and the body an instrument and the heart a beat and God only comes alive when we dance. We've been here before standing on the shoulders of the ancestors who told us how to make something out of nothing and summon light out of darkness. Fear not, we've been here before. Thank you. And yes, and yes we have, what a wonderful reading, thank you. 
Um, up next, Michael Garrigan. Uh, thank you for having me. That was beautiful. Uh, this is a short poem. It's called Ashland. Uh, the first few lines are based on a note from my Nana. So Ashland. The town of Ashland is almost completely abandoned because of the gases coming up from the old mine. Many years later, they're still coming up. Maybe we live on a rock balloon and all these punctures are slow leaks and soon we collapse, a crumbling deflation of sediment, schist, shale, all the rock, all the fossils, all the detritus and death of billions of years and lives. And when empty, we aimlessly flap around the solar system, losing our orbit like dried November leaves until a burst, strong and quick, breaks the last of us into tiny little pieces, floating and falling into the punctures of the universe, filling space, gathering into a new world built on the abandoned towns and paled by our lust for light. Ah, thank you. Lovely. All right. Up next, we have Marjorie Madox. Thank you, Jacqueline. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen because this is a collaboration with photographer uh, Karen Elias. So I wanted you to be able to see a large image of this. Um, Karen and I have been collaborating on a number of photographs, probably about 25 or 30 now. And when she first uh, sent this to me, I couldn't decide if it was a fence or a, a graded bridge. Um, but she had it titled Memorial for George Floyd in Black and White. And here's what she says about it. When George Floyd died in late May, our bridal bush was blooming. For me, the flowers against the black great spoke to the way spirit persists even in the crevices of our most inhumane societal institutions. Beauty refuses to be caged. And I was thinking about the image of the fence around uh, the White House and um, the, uh, the protest, the calm protest um, at that time in Lafayette Square. And so that's where the idea for this poem came from in response to this photograph. Memorial for George Floyd in black and white. Cracked, gray, gone dead, the stone cold heart pinned by the pale blooms of buds in the city that fences out cherry blossoms and peace, rubber bullets, pepper balls, smoke bombs, all the unconstrained and all call, uncalled for on parade to a photo op across Lafayette Square, its border street now renamed in bright caution yellow to St. John's Episcopal, where the everyday horror of now is colorfully on display in black and white. The charade of posing for the political gone viral, the reality not virtual, of knees, necks, nooses, chains, chain links, fencing out, fencing in, not again, but still. Or is it a bridge, narrow, graded, not beside still waters, but over the teeming, the troubled waves of multitudes crossing the deadly current, not to the old promised land of denial, but to this other side, rocky but reclaimed, vast, expansive, unending, ready to till, to sow, to harvest. Even now the faint scent of grain strewn blossoms beginning to resurrect the morning breeze. So thank you for, for letting me thank share. Thank you, Marjorie. Thank you, Karen. Um, a really fine collaboration that we were glad to include in the journal. Um, up next, we have Lenore Weiss. Thank you, Jacqueline. So uh, this is a piece called History's Eye is Bloodshot. And it begins with an epigram from Daniel Defoe's A Journal of the Plague Year. The apprehensions of the people were likewise strangely increased by the error of the times. This morning it's quiet, no leaf blowers or waste management trucks. 
My family worries about my hearing going in and out like the tides. I am the moon. The only sound is a pine cone dropping on my patio with a notable thud. White pine trees around the perimeter of our unit needle each other just like our condo conversations. The raven's glossy feathers are luminously black. They eat ants and other insects, also animal poop. In doing so, they help to keep our condo walkways clear from any mordant piles that a resident may have forgotten to scoop up in plastic bags that are provided throughout the area. But sometimes the bags aren't replaced or a dog owner may come downstairs unequipped. They have only the ravens to thank for protecting their good names, patrolling our walkways for rodents, omnivores that eat whatever they can. About 300 feet outside my window is a fire trail that ascends along a stream to Merritt College. It has been become a favorite for dog walkers who are allowed to escort their charges off leash. Long before I arrived, the area was home to the Ohlone Castanoan peoples. History's eye is bloodshot. In the late 1880s, the discovery of iron pyrite along the canyon by Francis Marion Borak Smith almost launched a new gold rush, but it wasn't the real thing. Still, pyrite had other uses. From the 1890s to the mid 1930s, pyrite was processed into sulfuric acid. However, its value dropped after people discovered the acid was a waste product from the refinement of petroleum. There's another caterpillar turn. Across the street from the condos, the site of the former Oak Knoll Naval Hospital, which is being converted into 918 homes. Deer, opossum, skunk, and coyote have already escaped to higher ground making way for an additional 72,000 square feet of retail space. My neighbors are considering whether to stay or relocate. A lady I know from the parking lot has moved to Oregon. She knocked on my door and gave me her extra rolls of toilet paper. Another neighbor gave me his aloe plant because it was too large for him to move. Here's where it gets confusing. Blue Radish lives downstairs. I call him that because he dyes his hair blue and because he's shaped like a radish. Also because he wears striped socks. Blue calls me little mama because he says I remind him of his mother. As far as being little, that part's totally true. I wear a five double A shoe. I have to buy them in the little girls section. Mary Janes with lots of daisies and rhinestones. Patent leather gets cracked in the rain. Shoes or no, I can fly. Something that Radish doesn't want to accept. He says, sure I can, and so can pigs, which I never thought was funny. I mean, if I saw a bunch of flying pigs, I'd think any number of things, but I'd never laugh my head off. Anyway, Blue Radish is strange. Sometimes he taps on my door and asks if I ever saw a dish run away with the spoon and gives me a slice of cake he can't eat because he's diabetic. I ask, mm, what happened to the rest? And he says, there is no rest. I say, it's probably sitting on your kitchen counter. He doesn't say no either, but bends down and pulls up his striped socks. So that's a portion of the uh, uh, entire piece, History's Eye is Bloodshot. And thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for a fine reading. Up next, we have Ann Fisher Worth. Hey, so I just have to say a little word about my poem. It's in three parts. I teach at the University of Mississippi. And probably you know that recently we had a big controversy about the Confederate statue. 
that's what the first part is about. The second part um, refers to some team teaching that I did at Parchman, the state penitentiary out in the Mississippi Delta. Okay, so this is called These Days, Mississippi. One, first they said they'd never move the statue. Then when George Floyd died, they said they'd move the statue to the quiet edge of campus where soldiers brought from Shiloh who died at the campus hospital were buried. A field of grass, anonymous ever since a groundsman took the headstones off to mow and forgot where he should put them back. Now they want to make a Confederate shrine. A walkway with a bench and lights will curve around the statue filmed for continuous surveillance. Bless his heart, they say here. It means he's really stupid, or it means we see right through him. So bless their hearts, board of trustees of the institutions of higher learning, 12 white birds in a burning tree. Two, I will never see Ernest again. For if someone breaks parole and they send him back to Parchman, they can keep him there forever. I will never see Ernest, who could barely read, who could barely write, whom I taught, whom I loved. Ernest from Jackson, who wrote about swimming as a kid with other black folks at the Ross Barnett Reservoir. And when I said, ironic, he grinned and said, I know. Ernest, the scar on his arm had never seen stitches, but ran from elbow to wrist in a terrifying flesh ditch. Who missed class twice because the diet of bologna stopped him up so bad he had to go to hospital. Who was obviously trusted, he cleaned the building and took out trash who was huge, who was housed in pre-release, not because he'd be released, but to calm the other men. I wish you could stand in the presence of Ernest. When we met each week, he would hold his hand to his heart. When we parted that last time, we hugged each other close and long. Why, you ask? Do I not visit Ernest? They'd never let me in, the class is done. And I am neither friend nor family. Three, I'm kind of old and ill. I grieve but cannot march. So I chalked Black Lives Matter at the bottom of our driveway. Then my neighbor chalked Black Lives Matter at the bottom of her driveway. But now Juneteenth is over and someone has scrubbed the asphalt clean. And thank you for your fierce and tough poems. Thank you. And last, but definitely not least, Brad Walwyn. Thank you. Beautiful words, everyone. This piece is called Coloring. Ain't we the fauna here? The coloring? The surrounded? The exposed? Why these indoors pretend no safety for the latched, the handcuffed, the confined? Seen and heard. Seen and not heard. Sun dial moon high endured. The ground crush of human darkness survived. The fauna slip through rust splotched bars paroled to a non forgiveness. Brown desiccate leaf absolution for a system's crimes. Eight minutes. 46 seconds, a kneecap braised smoke tessic's neck bone. We fried noose backs into an afternoon run. Hunt, 
hack, shoot, snap, picks, pixel, Vimeo, the viral rewinds. The fauna, bear witness. The fauna, the ones who make the sun worth everyone's time. 1,000 years from now, we'll be here to testify. The middle, the mulch, the muddled, the mulled over. We are the vine, the path, the trod, the vineyard, the prelude, the premise to generations and generations of altered states. When they come for us, we will tell them we are the fauna here. Find your place. We will show you where it is you belong. <laughs> Bravo. Bravo. <laughs> oh, thank you. I want to thank all of the writers this evening. Thank you for your focus, uh, your steadfastness. Uh, I believe your voices were made for this time. Um, I'd like to think that the, the, the themes of this issue chose us. Um, and I really appreciate the work that you contributed to the works of resistance and resilience. Um, we can take a moment and try our hand at a Q&A amongst ourselves. Um, and I'll just put it out. Do any of you have questions for each other? Or comment even? Mm. Well, I just loved listening to all the voices. I thought it was, you know, really wonderful flow and companion pieces um, that really looked at what it means to be living in this moment. So I just wanted to thank everybody and uh, thank you, Jacqueline and the staff at, uh, at the journal. Welcome. Welcome. Anyone else? Well, I've enjoyed your reading. Um, I know that this will, some version of this will end up on YouTube. Uh, highly edited, I will say. Uh, <laughs> um, but I think at this point, um, uh, uh, I'm going to close the reading. I want to thank you. Um, and I believe this this particular version will have a large afterlife. Um, since we kind of missed our audience. Um, <laughs> anyhow, all the best to you, and uh, I'm, I'm going to close this out. Thank you. The reading was great. Thank you. Thank you.